106.5 FM and online. It's the After 5 Guest with Wynn Thomas. And time now for my After 5 Guest. That is Roger Stennett and his uh, new book, 40 Poems for Dylan Thomas. Roger, thanks for coming this afternoon. Oh, my pleasure, Wynn. My pleasure. Um, let's... Um, Let's go to the foreword, which is written by Jeff Hayden, historian and creator of the Dylan Thomas Birthplace. He describes the book as an essential voyage through time in verse. Tell me your thoughts on that. Well, I like to think it is. I mean, I've been studying the work of Dylan Thomas probably for more than half a lifetime. And I admire his work. Um, I'm fascinated by the story of his life. And I wanted to reflect something of my interpretation of his life from childhood through to death, you know, and at mm-hmm. the same time bring my own sense of being a, a working poet to the project. So the project is very much an amalgamation, if you will, of, um, of his work and life and my work and life. That's how I see it. You start with a young Dylan. Tell us about what he's like in his youth. Well, remarkably not like how most people picture him now, because, I mean, sadly, the image very often of Dylan that people have is of the older Dylan who'd been worn down by the world, perhaps by um, you know, some behavior which wasn't particularly caring and kind. Of course, everybody knew that he liked to... Uh, a little drop to drink, although dear Jeff, um, who I really admire for the work he's done with the uh, with the birthplace, says that he probably didn't drink more than most men of his time. You know, we're talking of a time before the telly. So what did people do? Often they went to the pub. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So he packed a lot into 39 years, didn't he? An awful lot into 39 years. Oh, goodness gracious me. I mean, absolutely so. And, of course, there are things about his life which people perhaps think they know, but perhaps they don't know that well. Um, I mean, one of the things that draw me, uh, it has always drawn me to him, apart from the, the, the value of his work and the great literary merit, is he loved his childhood. And he grew on his childhood as the theme of many poems and certainly many prose works. And this is an area that connects both of us, because similarly, I mean, I grew up later, I grew up in the 1950s in Cardiff, but I still look back, perhaps through rose-tinted glasses, at my childhood, uh, growing up in a suburb called Whitchurch in Cardiff, and I draw a lot of my inspiration from those days, too. Um, But they also, I think, and not in any way detracting from the time uh, he spent in Larn, but he was only in Larn for not that many years, four or five years towards the very end of his life, whereas he was into his 20s living in um, in Uplands, in Cumdonkin Drive, um, at number five, Cumdonkin Drive, there's a rhyme, and most of his really famous work uh, was written whilst he was living in Swansea. Um, and in that, you know, semi, you know, semi-detached house on a hill. Yeah. So, um, Jeff also writes that uh, not a book to read plus all at once, but a dip into it. Do you see it that yes. way? Oh, very much so. I mean, it's uh, there's an awful lot of words in it. I mean, there are 40 poems, and they are uh, contemplative pieces. They're pieces that one perhaps ought to read and think about. Um, I mean, Dylan himself said that a, a, a poem a, that is a good poem ought to be made with holes in it so that meanings that the poet perhaps didn't intend can creep or flash in, you know. So one of the great things about poetry is, apart from being, I think, a very accessible art form, um, is it speaks to us and can speak to us in a million different ways. And I'd like to think that when people read the book, they'll read the poems and consider them before moving on to the following poem, and so it goes. You had quite an extensive uh, career in writing, but it came late to poetry. Why was that, do you think? Uh, but uh, but uh, he came 
relate to poetry. I'm sorry, I missed the question. I said uh, you came. You like an extensive writing career, but oh, you, you do well, say you came. No, yeah. I, I came early to poetry. Oh, sorry. And okay. I then put it down. <laughs> That's the point, really. Ah, I right. started. I started writing poems in my teens because it was uh, a good way to get to know girls. Basically, <laughs> I mean, I had no. I had no etchings for them to come up and see when I was 16. Um, you know, but my, my, if you offered to write a girl a poem, oh my goodness me, you became Jack the Lad. You were sought after. Well, that's a bit of an exaggeration, but um, I, I've always loved reading and writing poetry, and I seriously did it. Um, the very first poem I ever got paid for was published in an August Welsh magazine called the Anglo-Welsh Review uh, in the 1960s, and I was paid 16 shillings and eight pence. So from that moment on, I reckoned I was a professional, you see. <laughs> and I, I wrote nothing but poetry, probably, for 10 years. Um, I worked often on the Cardiff poetry scene. That sounds very flash. A good friend of mine is a very fine Welsh poet called Peter Finch, Oh yes, um, yes. And we 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 ran a, you know a little workshops and brought out little you know magazines, slim all the rest of it, and I loved it. Now I went off to university. I kept writing poems. I kept meeting women, and and so it went, and so it went until a few years later, I wrote my first stage play, um, and by a huge stroke of luck. Uh, it was put on in London within a few months of writing it, and they paid me money. Oh. <laughs> so I thought, well, this is, this is better than work. And I started to write for the theatre. And having grown up around the theatre with my dear dad, Stan, um, it wasn't an unnatural change for me to make, although what I was doing was very different from dad's work in variety and popular entertainment. But I spent thereafter probably 30 years not writing poetry at all. I wrote uh, stage plays, I wrote uh, radio dramas, I wrote a huge number of animation series, um, and the little line I tend to throw away is I'm the only person on the planet who's written for both Sooty, the club <laughs> puppet, and the Royal Shakespeare Company. Marvellous. And most things in between. But everything changed with COVID, as it did with so many people's lives. All the theatres closed, didn't they? And all the television production, the film productions I was working on. And one day, I was looking out the window, and I thought, well, why don't I write a poem? So how many poems, so, have, how many poems have you written so far, then, would you say? Oh, my God, since COVID, yeah. 4,000 wow. poems since COVID. Right. Very often I marry them with pictures that I've taken and I, I bring words and images together. So that many, and I've got a new book coming out in the summer, which will be 101 of them uh, together. And uh, it saved my life in a way. I mean, you know how it was in COVID. Yeah, so yeah, something to yeah. Do. Um, and for me, it was to see if my poetic muse was still around. And she was with us in the frame now, but nevertheless, she hasn't left me alone. And, didn't desert me, so I took my... And now, there's no, not a day goes by, I don't write at least one poem, and sometimes more. So let me... Um, let me uh, yeah. let me just stop you there. Let's, uh, let's let's talk about Lani. You said that uh, you didn't spend a lot of time there, but you're still can associate with uh, Dylan. Um, you wrote oh, a, yeah, the, a, a, abso absolutely. Yeah. I mean, the point the point really is that um, it was associated because it was such an important place to him. Yeah, yeah. And of course, he brought his family up there. Um, I was very fortunate that I knew Aronwi, uh, his daughter. Uh, I didn't know his two sons. But I knew his daughter, Aronwi, and we had our first books of poems published together in the late 70s. So uh, I was able to get a very private insight into her father and her mother, uh, Catherine, of course, through talking to her. Yeah. And, you know, you know, of course, his, his little writing house is, is hut at the, along the lane where you know, mm -hmm. Catherine used to lock him in uh, and only let him out at night for the pub. <laughs> so, uh, you know, and that's, of course, where uh, Under Milkwood really saw the uh, light of day. But it's fascinating how, you know, he was like so many writers, 
chasing his tail all the time financially. Um, and whilst he didn't do himself any favours because of, you know, being a bit profligate, um, the life of a freelance writer is never easy. You know, there's no paycheck at the end of the week or the end of the month. You've just got to make it work for you, which is kind of what I did. You know, I had to learn to write not just one form, but I have to write theatre, radio, uh, animation, ba boom ba boom ba boom And when I uh, went into it, freelance, uh, and here's a big name drop, Ted Hughes, the mm-hmm. great Ted Hughes, yeah. the poet laureate, wrote me a sweet letter because I knew him, we were mates. And he wrote, he said, force, F-O-R-C-E, force writing to evolve to support you. And whatever you do, stay away from employers. So since 1984, when I became a freelance writer, I've tried to do what Ted told me to do. Right. Let me look at your, let me look at your writing. I'm going to just talk about the book, which is obviously what you came for. Um, so poems, um, let's look at one which is called Lan, but I think you write like a, a Dylan-esque lines in that. Did you sort of deliberately do that? Because I got the feeling when I read that, I thought, oh, that sounds a bit like Dylan. Um, well, the, the honest answer is no, I didn't do it deliberately. Um, but uh, when you've been reading Dylan's work for 50 years, you know, things dissolve. Sounds rub off you, um, yeah. And, you, you know, your voice, every poet's voice, every dramatist's voice is unique and individual. But we are all influenced by those who we admire. Um, I, I think it would have been a bit sad if I deliberately sat down almost to pastiche Dylan's work. But, you know, um, I mean, a good line is a good line, whoever writes it, yeah. really. You know. So that is followed by Under Welsh, Old Welsh Skies, which is a kind of conversation with Dylan. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, the point, the point really is that um, the dramatist in me kicked in. Uh, I mean, I write poetry like a dramatist. And I write drama like a poet. And it's no coincidence that an awful lot of my work uh, as, um, as, a, as a dramatist has had a literary dimension. I've written pl- uh, plays about Wilfred Owen and D.H. Lawrence, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and, and it's nice, almost dramatically, to imagine uh, that we're talking like, you know, like mates, really, about the price mm-hmm. of fish and everything else under the sun. So it was just a nice poetic challenge to do that. So back to the early part of the book now, and uh, the, the, the poem I looked at was uh, Jumpers for Goalposts. Um, yes. Would you like to read perhaps one or two verses from that particular poem for us, please? I, I, I will, with great pleasure. I mean, it's a, a long, it's a longish, uh, it's a longish yeah, poem. So, so just give me the uh, first. Consequently, uh, I'll give you a couple of stanzas. But it's all based upon childhood again. It's all based on the idea that Dylan used to come and see me, because he didn't in Cardiff, where I grew up, and we play football on the common. And uh, as kids have done since the beginning of time, we put jumpers down as a goalpost. So okay, then. here's just a little bit of it. Okay. But our favourite game of all was played with an old leather ball. Jumpers for goalposts. When all the poets came to play... We pick up sides, choosing carefully from serried ranks of versifiers. Who'd be best goalie? Who best in midfield? Who was out to lunch dreaming of daffodils growing in profusion along the wing? Club-footed Lord Byron was a great fullback, solid as a brick shooters, a future nobby styles but with teeth and smiles. Wordsworth was hard work in fairness. Alexander Pope was spiteful, twisted, and bitter, but a better inside left you'll never find. Playing rocking horse, horse jinking, rhyme games around forwards, the wasp of Twickenham stinging them. The foreign lads seemed very cocky. Baudelaire was really there, and Arthur Rambo brought licorice that would give us all the buns, but such fun. Goethe in between the sticks was a Teutonic given, safe pair of hands. Blind Johnny Milton was referee. We all felt childishly sorry for him and loved his confused guide dog. Paradise lost. And yes, he was. That's just a bit of it. Lovely, Roger. Thanks so much indeed. Well, thanks so much for being my After Five guest today. It's been a delight to talk to you. Good luck with the book. A great, a great pleasure. Thank you, sir.
much. And come back to us when the 101 is published as well, if you wouldn't mind, please. In July, and I certainly will. Thank you, and all the best to you. All the best to you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.